Mitch, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm very excited to kind of pick your brain. Thank you, glad to be here. So I have to ask, you're the man of the esoteric, the mysterious. How did you first come across the golem? Wow, I probably started hearing about the golem legend when I was a little kid. Uh, growing up in Queens, here in New York City, where I'm speaking from, I was fascinated uh, with folklore of every kind. I grew up in a fairly traditional Jewish household, and I must have known about the golem myth as soon as I was old enough to talk. <laughs> Mitch, uh, the, the golem is, uh, of course, uh, a product of Jewish folklore and a, a story that's uh, come down in a variety of uh, different forms. Um, in essence, the the golem, you know, legend begins with Rabbi Lowe, this rabbi who looks to the stars and looks to to the mystery in the stars and sees misfortune coming for his people and that's sort of what motivates this uh you know cre uh, creature that he creates um i wonder if you could talk a bit about this idea of uh looking to the stars uh to to see what may be coming uh, is a, a concept of the esoteric and maybe even some of the history behind that. Yeah, it's very interesting. In the silent film, The Golem, uh, Rabbi Lowe is explicitly shown scanning the skies for prophetic signs. And in fact, as it happens, the astrological season that the film identifies is the very same one that we happen to be in right now as we're speaking, oddly enough. This also, by the way, is Mary Wollstonecraft's birthday today, August 30th, uh, speaking of another golem myth. The fact is, the, the ancient religions were connected to subjects that we today would regard as occult or esoteric, but were very much a part of the walk of faith and belief in religious movements around the world, you know, dated back to antiquity, including things that we today would refer to as astrology, divination, alchemy. In some ways, the Golem tale is a tale of alchemy. The idea that the individual is connected to the cosmos, and we can look to the cosmos, whether it be uh, the stars or whether it be other facets of the natural world, and see ourselves reflected in these things. Uh, there was a period of time in which Judaism, uh, up through late antiquity and to some extent even into the early medieval period, was involved with practices that we today would refer to as astrology. The term astrology wasn't necessarily used as such at that time, but the idea that the individual is connected to the cosmos has been a motivating religious idea throughout most of human history across most faiths. Do you think there's a connection between that connection to the stars, to space, and then the juxtaposition of this m creature made of clay, made of the earth? Is that something that you see throughout kind of the mysticism through different faiths? Well, there's a, a formula that goes back to the philosophy called Hermeticism, which was basically an amalgam of ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian philosophy that was formulated in late antiquity in the decades immediately following the death of Christ. And, and that, that famous formula goes, as above, so below. And you really find some variant of that within every religion. Within Hebrew scripture, you find a variant that says, God created the individual in its own image. I mean, really, that's just a way of restating as above, so below. So the idea of connectedness was, at least at one time, a very, very central idea within almost all of the ancient faiths. The idea that if the individual was created in the image of the creator, however one conceives of that, it stands to reason that the individual is also capable of creating life within his or her own sphere. And you see that very much within the Golem story, but one of the moral conundrums of the Golem story is the question of what is life? Just because you can make something formless into something animate, does that mean it's a, it's a sensible being? Does that mean it's a thinking being? Does that mean it's a feeling being? 
And the answers to that are very ambiguous. If the answers are yes, then one has no right to destroy it. If the answers are no, then it starts to become a tale of humanity's limitations and, and, and hubris. So, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of to what degree you know, can we understand ourselves as creators has animated existential and religious thought for many, many centuries. And it's a tormenting question, as the psalmist says, uh, ye are as gods, but ye shall die as princes. So there's this constant tension in human life that we feel ourselves possessed of the abilities to create, the abilities to be like the gods, or the abilities to be like the creator. But we also function within a realm of grave limitations. And that's reinforced in part by the events of, of the Golem myth in its various forms. Mitch, in the, uh, the, the film we see there's this secret word that is, is used to animate the, the, the golem. Um, I get the sense that's not just something they made uh, up for this film. Is, is there a history of secret words used to, to cause magic to happen or to cause creatures to animate? Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the great secret words uh, in Judaism, I, I, I have it tattooed here. It's, some might regard this as sacrilegious. I certainly don't mean it as such. yod heh vav heh the unpronounceable name of God. And according to legend, if the individual could figure out how to pronounce it, he or she would become all-powerful. You know, that's the, the, the urtext of secret words, at least as far as the Judeo-Christian tradition is concerned. Now, in many variants of the Golem myth, uh, Rabbi Lowe or another figure who's animating the golem is said to place the Hebrew word emet uh, into the creature's mouth or onto the creature's chest and one of the ways in which the creature is returned to dust is that one of the letters is removed from the word and an emet is, is transformed into, into met or death and then the creature returns to dust. There are many different variations of this and sometimes there are different words, sometimes the word itself is, is torn up, but it's this idea that language itself is a creative force and it's interesting, you know, if you look at human development, we learn to speak before we learn to write, you know, and in scripture we're told first there was the word, this idea that the word has creative power again is 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 a concept that's run through most religions and the notion that 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 words can create that that sound creates reminds us of an important facet of human development not only in terms of the individual but in terms of where our myths and stories come from including the story of the golem itself which is that these things start out as oral tradition and it's it's interesting, you know, I mean, we, we love to reference authors from the ancient world as if we can get our arms around who these people were, you know, Homer or Lao Tzu, the great Chinese sage, or Socrates or what have you. We have very, very limited evidence that these individuals, in fact, existed, you know, and, and in antiquity, it was not common for an author, and we, the term author wasn't even really used, it was not common for a scribe to display an individual personality. Very often a scribe was speaking on behalf of a, a school or a government or a certain philosophy. They either did not affix a byline to what they wrote or if they did affix a byline to it, it might have been the name of a king or a god or the name of a school or the name of a mythical figure in order to lend gravity to what they were doing. So it really wasn't until modernity that authors took on individual personalities. It used to be that all of our stories, all of our ideas, all of our sciences emerge from spoken word, emerge from schools, emerge from oral tradition, and only later got written down. So, so the word, in the most literal sense, is, is a primeval source of power. In talking about power, when I watch the golem, at first I connect with the Rabbi Lowe, but then I connect with the golem and yeah. this creature who is, for me, I want to have agency over, over themselves. Do you see that throughout mythology and throughout history of this creature that's created but then starts to evolve? 
it's the whole thing is very interesting, you know, the moral conundrum that the golem presents us with, because it's typical to say, well, that's human hubris for you. There you go. It's like the story of Icarus flying too close to the sun. It's like the story of Victor Frankenstein, you know, creating a monster. It's the story of Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. And yet we have to pause before that because there's also something inevitably human about all of it. You know, in one of the versions of the Golem story, after the Golem destroys the village that he's created to protect, uh, Rabbi Lowe confronts God and yells, you know, would you have it that we don't defend ourselves? Would that be a better way for me to proceed? Would that be a better way for me to live? And, you know, if you look at the story of Icarus, which everyone knows, you know, flies too close to the sun and his, his wings of wax are melted and he falls to earth. Again, it's supposed to be a story of, 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 of human hubris. But in a way, you could also see it as a story of the apotheosis of the individual reaching his or her own highest development. And then again, ye shall die as princes, as Psalms tells us. You know, we, we pass away. We are temporal. But we wouldn't be human if we didn't reach. We wouldn't be human if we didn't reach. You know, would, uh, mythically speaking, you know, who would Rabbi Lowe be if he said, well, I have this power to create this creature which could protect my people, but uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to pause. I'm going to freeze. You know, and, and I, I, I think that these stories of, of hubris are, are perhaps they come to us, you know, too quickly. We embrace them too quickly as these moralistic stories. I mean, who would we be, you know, again, speaking mythically, if it weren't for Prometheus stealing fire from the gods and bringing it to earth and permitting humanity to, to cook and to make things and, and to heat metals and so forth. And yes, in heating those metals, we can make jewelry, we can also make weapons, but it may be that, it may be that the price of creativity, the price of being truly human is friction. And, and that's something that we also learn from the Golem story. Mitch, there's a, a, you know, the the thematic and esoteric ideas, you know, of the film, but it, it also is one of the earliest horror films. Yeah. And as a, a horror film, a lot of the ideas that are introduced in this uh, early horror film are archetypal in that they, they seem to keep reappearing through other horror films, you know, that... Uh, uh, would rise in history later. Um, what what is your take on the, the the golem? How he came into the world as a a horror film, and what what do you think was uh, uh, the purpose of that film in that moment in time in 1920 when the the film was released? Well, it seems to me that there were a wealth of proto-horror films entering the world in the silent film era, late 19-teens, early 1920s. And I suppose it's because these are the urtexts of humanity. This is our situation. We wonder about who we are when we look in the mirror. We wonder about what's standing behind us when we're in the dark. We wonder about our safety, our abilities, our creative capacities. And it seems to me that the Golem story is one of the it's one of the basic stories of, of human nature. You know, we, we see it reflected back to us in Frankenstein. We see it reflected back to us in 2001, A Space Oddity. We see it reflected back to us in Blade Runner. We see it reflected back to us whenever we ask about the limits of our capacity to create. And the myth of Prometheus, for example, is in a way a golem story in that Prometheus steals fire from the gods to bring it down to humanity and winds up paying a horrific price, a horrific punishment to it. We're constantly asking, how far can I reach? How far can I reach? How close can I get to the fire of wisdom, of knowledge, of understanding until that fire burns me? And that's the basic human question. We see that in the golem in a way that obviously is it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's, it's cinematic, but it's one of the basic human stories. And there were a lot of such stories populating silent cinema at the time. One could always say, well, you know, maybe it was some kind of existentialist 
question that followed humanity out of the First World War, and that's possibly true, but every generation has crises, every generation has millennialist questions, every generation knows its share of, of warfare or feels that it's standing on some sort of a precipice. I think it's just simply the fact that these are universal stories of human exploration and universal stories in which the individual asks himself, you know, who am I? How far can I go? How far can I take things? How close can I get to the flames before the flames burn me? Piggybacking off, off of that, I feel like there's a thin line between fear and attraction. And I find that that's very much shown in the film, but it's a theme that's gone for centuries. Why, why is that? Why are we kind of attracted to fear and vice versa? It's very interesting. You know, first of all, we feel very alive when we're confronted with fear. And we may tell ourselves that we don't want conflict. We may tell ourselves that we don't want friction. And yet we feel tremendously alive when we're encountering these things. And I often encourage people to ask themselves the question as I ask myself the question. When you're complaining about feeling anxious or eager or you can't sleep, make sure, make sure that there's not a part of you that's not actually very attracted to that state. You know, make sure that before framing that as a problem, you've at least asked yourself the question of, of, of whether it's, it, there's also desire intermingled with that. You know, we certainly see enough people engaging in pursuits that are supposedly scary as pastimes. You know, the most innocent might be horror movies, roller coasters, and, and there's, there's plenty of things that go much, much further out from there. And I think that we do experience a thrill when we're afraid. There's a kind of feeling of aliveness that accompanies it. And I think a lot of us, myself included, describe situations that we may frame as maladies, as problems, but there's a part of us that's secretly attracted to these things. And it's no joke, of course, because there are also people who seek out conflict in life on an intimate scale and are constantly saying things or doing things that, that tripwire arguments, that tripwire trouble, that tripwire friction, that tear families apart. And you know, again, I think sometimes people do those things for a kind of a thrill. It might be a perverse thrill. It might be a false feeling of life. But we human beings tend to be very self-interested creatures. So when we find ourselves in repetitive situations, it behooves us to ask, am I looking for this? Am I trying to do this? And of course, one also has to ask if you could mythically find yourself in the position of Rabbi Lowe or of Victor Frankenstein or of any other figure who's able to create the ineffable, uh, where would be your sense of hubris then? Would you hold back or would you let fly your full powers? I suspect humanity wouldn't be itself if it didn't let fly its full powers. Mitch, we're meaning-making creatures. Uh, and it's been said that art Sometimes uh, doesn't always provide the best answers, but art is an amazing way at uh, getting at questions and, and asking profound questions. When you think of the story of the golem, when you watch the film, The Golem, what are the, the questions that you feel this story, this film uh, pulls from us? Well, I might have responded differently 10 years ago than I would today. And great art, I think, should do that to us. It, it should evoke different responses from us at different periods of life. 10 years ago, I might have said, well, there's the, the archetypal story of human hubris for you. You know, it's the story of the Titanic. It's the story of uh, 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 the creation of artificial intelligence. It's, it's the story of the individual uh, outstripping his or her own reach. Today I feel differently. Today I, I feel differently. I think that it's a story of power. It's a story of the exercise of power. And both joy and tragedy are intermingled with it. In, in, in The Golem story is told differently, of, of course, among many different myths. But in some versions, the Golem does protect the Jews of 
of Prague and, and thereafter commits acts of destruction and its creator, sometimes Rabbi Lo, sometimes another figure, manages to return the creature to dust. It, in one myth, as the creature is returning to dust, it falls on top of the creator and, and crushes him and, and kills him. But again, how can we as humanity be ourselves unless we reach? You know, to me, it's a story, I suppose, of the polarity of power. There's great joy and accomplishment intermingled with great danger. And I think that's part of the human situation. And I really would like to ask, you know, who among us, who among us, if you could mythically find yourself in the position of Rabbi Lowe, would not do what he did? I would have to ask myself that question and yeah. really dig down. I think... My, for my final question, what space do you think stories like the Golem and stories of myth and the esoteric, what position will they have in the future? Do they have a place in the future? They're always going to be relevant because they are stories of human nature. And of course, we're always tempted to frame these stories in terms of our current political or social or personal concerns. And that's natural enough because these are basic stories of the human situation. And, you know, someone watching the golem in the space age is going to have one interpretation. Somebody watching the golem in the digital age is going to have another. Uh, the brilliant Kabbalistic scholar Gershom Sholem gave a talk on the golem as a myth in January of 1966 for the inauguration of a so-called supercomputer at the Institute uh, for which he was working in Israel at the time. And back then, we didn't even have the term digital age, you know, but these supercomputers, which would take up a whole room, seemed, you know, the, just the, 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 the apex of, of, of human progress and danger. And it was so appropriate that he was giving this talk, you know, right at the dawn of what we later came to call the digital age. You know, he was really making a commentary on the potentials of AI and what would it mean to us. I have no doubt that in as much as we in the early 21st century have our own applications of the golem, a hundred years hence people are going to have applications that are going to seem just as urgent because it's the, it's the basic human story. It's the basic human story. We want to know what's in the dark. We want to know what's around the next corner. And, and we're going to go there and we're going to find out and, and it's inevitable. And there's probably going to be a mixture of, of joy and tragedy accompanying that. And uh, like every great myth and story, it's, 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 it's endlessly relevant because it tells the story of who we are. The story endures. <laughs> Constantly, just as we do, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and you can interpret the story on an intimate level, you can interpret the story on a macro level, and I have no doubt that it, it, just as people in the mid-20th century had their very immediate interpretations of it, people 200 years hence uh, we'll have theirs, we today have ours, because it's, 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 it's part of being alive. It's the individual's quest to ask, you know, who, who am I? And in asking that question, who am I, and really following that thread, you're going to encounter a polarity, and that polarity is probably going to be a mixture of, of great joy as well as tragedy. Well, you've given me a lot to think about and to examine in terms of my relation to story and the story I've told myself. Um, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Time to Pleasure. Speak to us today. Pleasure. I really enjoyed it, you guys. Thank you.